episode number 56. We are here, three amigos, hanging out in a live setting, Lynchburg, Virginia. How are we doing today, gentlemen? Good. You have real, like, uh, announcer, like, game show announcer vibes right now, and I'm really liking it, actually. I, I can go, I can lean harder into it, like, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to in the bag today we've got in corner blue mister coming from the top rope tattoos everywhere he's not only gonna have a permanent ink on his skin but a permanent mark on your hearts give it up for mr brad jones hello yeah brad yeah. coming in ha- ha- happy 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 to be happy to be here robbie happy happy to be here <laughs> Do you want me to do an intro for you it, as well, Hunter? Whatever you're feeling. Yeah, I was waiting. I, <laughs> he wants it. He wants I was it. anticipating we got, yeah, it. We've got, if you're uh, not feeling it, I can just talk. In the red corner, he's coming in at a whopping six foot seven. You'll see True. him at least internet height, but what he also has coming from the internet is the ability to make you underestimate him, but don't underestimate what he's going to bring to this fight. We've got the man, the myth. Hunter Thomas. Brad the dead man. <laughs> what? Oh, this is aggressive. Oh, sorry. I forgot we weren't fighting. Yeah, I just assumed it was a UFC. I was yeah. ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. In the bag. Uh, I'm the MMA guy here. But in the bag. On episode <laughs> yeah, 60, we're taking a turn uh, and it's actually becoming a fight podcast. So. It's actually me in the ring. Yeah. In the ring, yeah. <laughs> Joe Rogan is going to call in. And instead a little instead later. of mics, it's just going to be mouth guards. And instead of a table, it's just going to be an octagon. Yeah. yeah. I like it. And it's going to be called UFC. But the best part is it's still going to be a podcast. Yes. So you're you like, it. And it's going to go to audio only. <laughs> yeah. yeah you'll, no just, you'll just hear a bunch of grunting and like men being thrown around. <laughs> don't, don't, breathing. Don't, don't tempt me with a good time. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, yeah. How, yeah. Anyways, well, guys, today uh, we got a special episode for you. We've got Hunter coming on for, this is, you're our most most appearances by guess. This, this is number third. 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 I think. Yeah. Because yeah, they did my actual in the bag episode. And then I did the bag theory episode. Yep. And now we're yeah. back for another in the bag episode. It, it might be four because y'all may have filmed one. Oh, yeah, we did. Me. This is my fourth because I've been three times with Robbie. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Four time. Yeah. Wow. Four time. So, like champ. once every like 12 weeks. That's so, I can't wait for sense. episode 68. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you Special go. There episode. you have it. What do you want to see him happen on episode 68? <laughs> Let's go ahead and get that checking in the comments. Um, so Hunter, we were playing this week. I've uh, been in Lynchburg all week and we uh, were out there on the course and we filmed this week. There's a video that's going to come out probably somewhere in the future. Uh, I think the film schedule is a little wonky right now because of y'all's trip y'all's got going yes. on. Um, and speaking of the trip, major presenting sponsor of your trip and a presenting sponsor of In The Bag, Flippy Disc Golf. Yep, always thanks to Aaron and Flippy. We appreciate you. Uh, you can buy these In The Bag shirts. We're gonna have new foundation shirts up very soon for the tour that are gonna be available. Robbie C shirts are gonna be up. Um, new performance wear coming out from Flippy that you'll be able to, to purchase as well with foundation and Robbie C logos on them. Just check it all out, all great stuff. Um, FlippyDisc.com or FlippyDiscGolf.com in the description and you can get a little bit of money off and some free shipping, so. Come on. Thank you, Aaron. You are the man. And that new Soul Pro, like, guys, Mm -hmm. if you've checked out Flippy stuff in the past, I promise you, you're going to want to reinvest your attention because this is the new Soul Pro stuff is it's sick. Uh, And the hybrid jerseys are even better. Yeah. If the T-shirt jerseys were a little too T-shirty for you, the hybrid ones are perfect. They're going to be great. Nice blend of dry fit and T-shirt. So absolutely. And the Soul Pro is full dry blend. Yeah. The yeah. polos are sick. Yes. Polos are great. So check them all out. FlippyDiscGolf.com. You said dry blend. I heard dry mud. Uh, and I was like, I don't know what that means. Uh, but you guys you guys deal with a lot more apparel than I do. Anyways, we're out there on the course. Uh, and we do a Brody Says round. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out, they did a similar video with Trevor. Or if you're watching this in the future, definitely go check it out. It's on their channel. Um, and I remember you saying at one point, like, if he gives me instruction for a flippy mid, I'm gonna be in trouble because this is as flippy of a mid as I have in my bag. So um, what we wanna talk about is like, as you've built your bag, do you have anything that like actually rides what you would say like the extremes or um, do you feel like there are actual gaps in your bag that you're aware of oh, and yeah. you kinda work around? Yeah, 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 so extremes, I definitely, I actually just took out one of the extremes because 
it was hurting me, which was the juggernaut, a little too extreme. Um, mm. I need to find my enforcer and probably put it back in. So I took the juggernaut out and I put a destroyer in as its placeholder, but it's a neutral destroyer, so not the same disc. Don't really know why I did that. But I have like my Firebirds, extremely overstable. I have a Zone OS. Like I have the extreme on the overstable side. Okay. Um, the only true, like really understable disc in my bag is the IT. Right okay. Now. That's it. And it really, does the IT come out on much of anything besides rollers Just for rollers. you? Just rollers. Yeah. But so. it's, it's very specific. So um, I actually, since that video, I took uh, the people's buzz out Okay. And um, cause that was my flippiest mid, not that flippy, um, dead, dead straight. And right now I just tentatively put in this old flippy buzz I have, um, just because we were going out to film yesterday, we were going to a different course. I needed something to flip up a little bit. Um, but I'm probably going to put when we go to the West coast, a much like uplink level flippiness in that slot. Um, the reason my bag has slowly been built this way is I think one time when I was on here, we were going through my bag and we were talking of like my mentality of mold minimalization and how it doesn't apply to my bag. And I had like 20 some molds. Yeah. And I was like, well, if I ever cared about what my score was, I would go back to okay. mold minimalization. Well, with the break 68 challenge, I started caring about Makes what my sense. score was. So my bag is mm. built for New London. And New London holds one through seven, one through eight, one through not, one through 10, can't miss right. Cannot miss right. Left, fine. Yeah. Can't miss right. So over time, as I've built my bag with the intention of scoring at New London, I don't need super overstable stuff. And I definitely don't need anything flippy. And so basically my bag has become mm. a mush of, I need neutral discs that go different distances. So okay. that's what has been built into my bag. Um, and I've become very comfortable with it. I feel like I could take this bag anywhere and score with it. Yeah. Um, when we go to the West Coast, we're gonna play a little bit more short technical stuff. And so that's why I want something that's really flippy where I can power down and still get that little flip up. Because anything in my bag right now to get it to flip, I have to throw it as hard as I can. Which at New London, if you want something to flip, it's because you want it to flip really far down the fairway and you're, you need to be throwing as hard as you can. Like hole three, I have to throw mid as hard as possible and, and have it hole, flip. Yeah. And so I just throw my hex, which when I throw my hex softer, it's just dead straight. Yeah, and this is, is this the same hex that you had in your bag when no. you came on like for MVP or is it, it's changed over time? Oh, it's okay. It's changed, this is actually ones. a fission hex. It's one of the foundation stamped ones. Um, 166 gram, which I know on the Trevor Stop show, y'all were talking about lightweights a little bit and yeah. how lightweight doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. I've always been a big believer of that. The most overstable destroyer I ever owned was a 157. Um, but this 166 gram hex started off really overstable, started off like a, MD3 Rock 3, where I would, could throw it flat and it was gonna dump. Now I can throw it with a little hyzer, it'll pop up to flat, and if I throw it flat, it'll turn for me. So it's starting to get to that neutron hex, like the one that used mm -hmm. to be in my bag, but yeah. Connor was telling me, um, before I got this hex, he's like, just be aware, fission hexes are the most stable. And this was a lot more stable than the two neutron hexes I tried. So mm -hmm. that's normally not true for fission in my experience, but the fission hex started a lot more stable. Um, and is now starting to kind of beat into that flip up and turn over hex like you're used to seeing me throw. Yeah. So this is the new hex in the bag, yeah. Have you messed around with the fission hex? Not the fission, I have a couple to try. I've just been stuck on the neutron one for a bit. I'm still working it, like getting comfortable with that one, but I haven't yeah. tried the fission. I typically don't like fission, but those ones that for whatever reason seem a little bit more grippy to me than like, mm. cause fission seems, for my grip seems slippery and those ones don't for whatever it's reason. It's similar to KC Pro where you gotta beat the um, like sheen off it. Yeah. Like once you throw it for a few rounds and it gets some like dirt in it, it yeah. starts beating up a little bit, it becomes grippier and grippier. Cause that's like I had a fission wave when we, I think the first episode I was transitioning to MVP. Yep, yeah, um, yeah we built it back. And I had, I had the fission wave in there post that episode. And that was my experience. It started kind of slick, but everyone told me mm -hmm. you wanted a fission wave. And then once I threw it for like a f two weeks, it got real grippy, but then it got to like roller level flippy. So the yeah. Fission Octane is the one that stayed for a long time. Yeah, and it happens fast. Like I think that's, we play, we shot a video yesterday and I ended up using my foundation stamped uh, Fission Hex because I've felt the same thing. And yeah. I've talked about in my bag right now, I had Origins, uh, I had two Origins, 
two reactors and then a justice like that was my spread from under to over and so i found that the glow hex was very similar to a fission reactor and so i was like okay well i'll pull that out and then i'll put a hex in the place of this origin and flip it out so that way i'm not like four mids across and so in an effort to like embrace the mold mineralization right now because yeah it's like started super overstable i'm like ugh. when i need like a little bit of flip up it's a shot missing in yeah. my bag. Uh, so as you're like seeing that and you have, is there like at what point would that fission hex, since it's like the flippiest in your bag for New London, at what point do you pull it and put another one in? Like, let's say, yeah, you're still trying to breach 68. Like at what point would that disc become unusable in your mind for that slot? It's for me. I'm a I'm mainly a confidence player, so I step up and I need to feel good okay. about whatever disc selection, shot selection, even if it's not the one that makes the most sense. Mm. Um, so the big thing for me is I'm hot with that hex right now, so I'm gonna be using it on shots that it's probably not intended for, but it'll get me close yeah. um, because I feel really good standing over a lie with it. Um, so I think the point that it'll come out of my bag, and this is kind of where the neutron one started to get, is when it starts doing things I don't expect it to. So it'll slow, like with discs, they'll slowly beat in and you can always expect because it'll just be like, oh, it stayed a hair straighter this time. And the next time I say like, from where this disc started to where it is now, it's a completely different disc, but I've had the same confidence the whole time through because it's I throw it so much and it slowly got there. Yeah. But once like two or three throws happen and it does something I don't expect, my confidence will drop. And then once I don't feel good, I just won't go for it anymore. Yeah. And so that's kind of what happened to the people's buzz over time is in the Comet, I still stand by. I like the feel of it, yeah. incredible flyer. But what was weird about the Comet was when thrown flat for me, it would turn, it was flippy. When thrown on hyzer, it wouldn't flip up. And so yeah. for my game, I never really throw flat. I just throw on different amounts of hyzer. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I need a disc that'll pop up on a little, like on a lot of hyzer, it'll pop up and go straight. And on a little hyzer, it'll pop up and turn. Yeah. And the Comet was a, the Comet I think is just a flat thrower's disc. I think it's just a very much like, yeah. if you're trying to like work through your form, people always say go to a putter because it, it shows you your flaws. Yeah. I think that's kind of what the Comet does. Okay. Like if I throw it flat, it's gonna go straight. Once I powered up on it, it would turn over, but on Annie it held the angle, on Heiser it held the angle. So like you can't mess up your, uh, your release angles. Yeah. But for me, my release angle is a Heiser. So when I'm trying to score, I'm not trying to work on a flat release. I need discs that are going to work with me on that hyzer. Um, so the hex, once it starts doing kind of what that comet did, where like I don't feel like I trust it anymore. Yeah. Then its days are numbered because okay. I'll eventually just start reaching more for the pink MD3 or something else in my bag that I can manipulate to do what it was doing. And next thing I know, it'll be five rounds and I haven't touched it. Yeah. And then you're like, why am I? Why and then is I'm like, why is this in my bag? Yeah, that's fair. Um, so. As someone who is also like a natural hyzer thrower, um, I know for me, when I'm trying to get that straight shot, especially if I'm playing in the woods and whatnot, um, I, because I'm throwing on so much hyzer, I end up having to be like, okay, I gotta throw, if if Brad can get away with a neutral disc, throwing it flat-ish, and I think we've talked about, we've definitely talked about it on the podcast before, uh, I don't know if we've talked about it, but like the belief that nobody throws true flat, like everybody's oh, thrown with a little bit of anything yeah, or a little bit of Everyone throws a little bit of their angle. Yeah, and so um, for all these folks out there that are like, oh yeah, a little bit of any, all that, neutral disc can work for them. I've always felt like I have to take, whereas, yeah, Brad can get away with an evader here, my evader to do the same shot has to be a little flippier or something like that because of the hyzer. So it's interesting to me that you like full powers where you're seeing those shots. So when you get to distance drivers though, you don't have a ton of, if any, flippy have, distance um, drivers in your bag, do you? So I have these two, I wouldn't classify as flippy flippy. Um, but like if I gave them to a flat thrower or an Anheuser thrower, they'd probably be unusable mm. for them. But the harder I throw, the more my body wants to just release on hyzer. Yeah. Um, not saying like I throw really hard, I'm gonna be like 90 degrees, but yeah. throwing really hard on Anheuser doesn't exist for me. Like it just does not happen. When I go to Anheuser, my form changes because I'm so used to being like leaned over my throw 
that my arm isn't able to get to Anheuser, so I have to fully change my run up and form, yeah. and I'm not as powerful with that form. So I can throw these on a little bit of Annie, and they'll still like f- flatten out for me and be okay, but the Curl and the DD3 um, are both similar for me. The Curl's a hair less stable, and they're both my kind of like quote unquote max distance. This The Curl is more like I'll throw it on Heiser and it'll flip up and ride to the right for me. Um, but it does still have a little bit of comeback at the end. Yeah. And the DD3 is just rip it on hyzer and it'll get me a full flight, but it stays in like a 20 foot wide window when doing it. Mm. So at New London, I can trust it a lot on those, you know, little bit tighter, but you need to rip a full shot fairways. Um, and even on like hole 10, for instance, I can just put a little more hyzer on it and it's hole 10 is like a 450 foot slight downhill hyzer for an arm like me something's got to flip up. I can't throw a pure hyzer. Yeah. Um, even though I try to most times, but <laughs> the DD3, I can just throw it on a lot of hyzer and it'll fight that hyzer, but never really like, it might get up to flat. I think the last video, which will come out in June, actually got all the way over and cruised and I was a little long, but it'll it'll flip up and like most of the time fight it, but not get all the way out, which gives me that extra distance I need on that hyzer line. So these two are my, my flippy distance drivers, but no, I don't, I don't typically ever carry something super flippy in that distance driver slot. Yeah. Um, mainly because if that's the shot I need, I see it as a touchy shot. And when I get the touchy shots, I'm weird. I wanna throw as hard as I can on a touchy shot. Yeah. So I'll typically disc down to a fairway so I know I can just pound uh, it. And then take the it. And then that. take the it or the passion or something. Cause I, I feel a lot more comfortable manipulating the angles of fairway drivers and distance drivers. That's fair. Whenever I get to a, a big rim disc, I just, I only know how to throw it one way. I honestly can relate to that a lot. And I think a lot of our listeners can, I don't know how you feel about it, Brad, but like I, like I spent so much time in the field trying to work on my form with putters and all that. And like, I, I've literally said in my videos that putters respond better to uh, nose up throws, things like that. So I was aware, okay, while I'm throwing these putters, I still have to throw them nose down, like focus on throwing them nose down. So that way when I get to a driver, I feel that. But like, I was so afraid of, and I hated the feel of like distance drivers in my hand that like, as soon as that rim hit my fingers, it was like, all right, everything you just learned. Nope. Uh, <laughs> you're, we're, we're back to an old form and we're going to do something. We're going to throw it differently. So yeah, I think that's definitely a thing for me, Brad. How about yeah, you? I, I, I kind of feel that way too, because I feel like subconsciously, if I grab like a 11 speed or 12 speed, I'm like, okay, in order for me that I know doesn't have a big arm, I've got to throw this as hard as I can to get this close to speed. You know what I mean? So I feel that that's kind of why I've limited. I don't throw anything above a 10 speed now. And I'm really focusing on that seven to nine speed if I'm going distance, just because I know my arm speed can kind of match those discs if I hit them right. And I can focus more on like form now, which is what I'm working on versus like full power shots. I know if I take my FD out, you've seen it this week, I don't have to throw it full power and I can get a very good flight uh, and a lot of distance out of just that FD. So Mm -hmm. I can 100% relate because that's exactly why I'm not throwing anything above that 10 speed slot right now for me. Yeah, that's that. mm, It's it is so crazy. The psychology behind like why we mess up certain shots and discs that you're like, oh yeah, this is going to work. This is going to do it. And then it feels good in my hand and then it just never does. Um, So Hunter, you said one of the big premises is that you've built it for New London, Mm -hmm. uh, but you feel like you can score and most any other course with it. So let's, let's dream. June's already recorded. So you come back from the Buggy Road Tour. You're playing the best disc golf of your life. You are even further ahead in the monthly match battle, you know, you're, okay. you're killing it. Do you, and then boom, you go to the course, you break 68, like it happens, uh, in July, bang, little birthday present from me. Here we go. Uh, for my birthday to you, here we go. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, my birthday's in July for everyone who wants to send me things. Um, mm-hmm. so do you start readjusting your bag now that you don't have to crush new london or do you think you'll kind of stick with this for a little bit maybe through creator's cut Uh, the only adjustment i'll make to this bag because this bag really there's two discs missing in it and that's it and that's a flippy mid and a flippy distance driver the flippy distance driver again 
that's a slot I never super carry. I've carried like a Thrasher in the past or a Hades, but every time I'm carrying that really flippy spot, yeah. I'm looking for the most overstable version of that flippy disc. So I'm like, I want the most overstable Thrasher that exists. Yeah. I want the most overstable Hades that exists because I just want them to flip up and ride a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really ever going for, like that's that's to me all I ever need from a flippy distance driver because if I need something flippier, I don't need a distance driver is typically where my mind goes or a lot of times I just throw a forehand. Mm -hmm. um, but the flippy mid is the slot that like, yeah, I could use that when we go to like Independence Park or Hideaway or something like that. Um, but that's the only, in that slot right now, is like the people's buzz. Now there's a different old buzz in it. Um, and like I said, it'll probably be like an uplink or something like that. But those that's like a trick shot type disc to where I'll throw it very rarely. And I think that's why like as I've built my bag for New London just subconsciously over time, yeah, I haven't even noticed it at other courses because mm. it's like very rarely do I go and I'm like, oh shoot, I just don't have a disc for this shot. Yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, I'll just have to throw my hex on Annie, yeah. and it, you know what? It typically works out, and if not, it might cost me a stroke around. Um, but it's not, mm. it's not the end of the world. So I could, I think I'll definitely put that flippy mid back in my bag. Uh, I'm mean, gonna put it in for the West Coast because you never know what shot you're gonna need when you're at a course you don't know. Um, but when we get back here, I'll just keep that in. Um, I'll probably take it out for New London. Only reason is. I love throwing stuff on hyzer flips and I don't want to be tempted with something that could flip over. Cause I, mm -hmm. the only way I'm gonna shoot under at New London is I gotta avoid OB. And so I don't want something that I'm like, I think I can make this shot work. And then it flips yeah. up and over and nothing in my bag right now will flip up and over. I have stuff that'll flip up, but nothing on that mid or fairway, which is what typically gets me in trouble on those shots, will flip up and over. So. I'll probably take it out until I break 68. But once I do, just the flippy mid is the only change that'll happen in my bag. Okay. The rest of it I'm comfortable with. So you said a couple things that are very interesting that I guess for me, like a still, I can be I can be called a fairly newer player still compared to <laughs> both of you. Yeah. Um, I think what, and I was thinking about this on the drive over today, I think it was very different about how maybe like someone like me that has to build a bag versus someone like you, Hunter, is what you said. You're like, okay, I can build this bag for New London, but I can go anywhere and have confidence with it because like you said, you can manipulate your disc a little bit better. You can do things that maybe like I can't do. Like I, I have decent control on power. I have not great angle control. So I feel like I have to build one bag that kind of fits all courses. And the way I'm doing that now is finding specific discs that do certain flights for me versus like, oh, I have a beat and buzz. I can throw these five shots with that if I need to. So I guess, and I feel maybe like most of our listeners are probably more toward my end maybe. Yeah. So what do you think, um, like, number one, do you think that's a true statement? And number or that's number one. Number two, do you, what do you think is the transition between someone's bag like mine and someone's bag like Trevor's if, or Hunter's, if that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, it's obviously time and skill, but like at what well, point do you start making that transition? First, I don't think that there's a right or wrong way about it. Like I think that you could go on the pro tour and find a bag that looks a lot like yours. And mm -hmm. you could go on the pro tour and find a bag that's even more gap heavy than mine. Mm -hmm. um, it all depends on the player. And so I think, cause like my ideal bag, if I didn't have to ever think about wind, would be a little bit more like a step on the flippier side than mine because my angle control doesn't go beyond flat. My Anheusers are like maybe a degree mm -hmm. of Annie. So for me, what angle control means is I'm going from Hunter flat, which is a slight hyzer, down to steep hyzer, mm -hmm. and I can do that with every disc in my bag. So, when I typically, like for instance, to go back to this hex, this hex on hunter flat, slight hyzer, will flip up and will turn when I throw it hard. Yeah. With a little more hyzer, it'll pop up, it'll go dead flat, and it won't fade. Mm -hmm. A little more hyzer, I can get it to pop up and fade. Mm -hmm. A lot of hyzer, it won't come up. So, this one disc, I can take and I can get it to throw a little bit of hyzer, it'll flip up and it'll ride to the right. A low, and then like I can I can hit pretty much any wooded shot with this disc. Mm -hmm. So that's why like when we actually, we just did a seven iron round on Robbie's channel, which basically is a one disc round that you feel like you can do anything with. 
I know this disc really well. The one that I'm not, I only know for certain shots is my MD3. So that's the one I chose to play in that round because I was like, I know what this does on a slight hyzer, but that's the only way I ever throw it. So I want to learn what this disc does on more hyzer, less hyzer, mm -hmm. and man how to manipulate it. It's basically just a shorter version of my hex. So mm -hmm. my hex will go, I mean, realistically, my hex will probably push 350 to 375, and I feel like that MD3 is more like 325 to 360. And so, yeah, that's not a huge difference, but when I'm at New London and every stroke matters and I'm not a great putter, 20 feet can be the difference between a yeah. 20 footer I'm terrified of and a mm -hmm. tap in. And so. I, I think your, and probably your accuracy range is, looks way different than mine. So you, you, can, you can tell the difference between that 20, 30 feet and you can probably control that 20 and 30 feet. My control is probably 50 feet if I had to guess, like if, if that makes sense. So I'm like, okay, this, I know that my, my uplink goes 250 feet yep. on average. This hole is 200 and or 225 feet. I feel pretty confident. I feel that I can land it in there. But if it's like, uh, maybe it's like 300, I, I can't push that disc. Like I don't have the confidence in pushing that disc, nor do I have the confidence in the angle or the highs I need to release on to get that full. I can't predict the flight, I guess is what I'm saying, as much as maybe you can. Um, so, and then the reason that this question's even come up for me, and again, some of this is maybe just time yeah. and like, and I don't know if this is a mentality of like newer disc golfers, cause I definitely have just gotten out of it recently. <laughs> it was, I like a new disc because I know exactly what it is supposed to do. I like the feel of it. Like now I'm, you know, with the use section, I'm like, Ooh, this one's like pretty beat in. I, I like this. This is, I know what this is going to do. And the thing, the, a disc is giving me like a glimpse of like some freedom, I think is this like really beat in electron envy that I found in the use section. I love the envy, yeah. but this one, it gives me the hand feel of an envy. It actually, I can, it's like, I don't know, very responsive if I give it a little bit of ante so I can get like a, a left or right shot uh, off the tee, like but a softer one with a putter. Um, I can do like these chip out like uh, forehands that will actually float left and kind of land softly. There, I'm throwing a lot of shots and I have a lot of confidence with it because it does all of these things. And I don't have a lot of discs that do so many shots for me. So I guess that's why this, that even came up because I see someone like you and even like Brody who has like, all right, I have vultures, all the, this particular vulture I can throw these four shots with, yeah. this vulture I can throw these four shots with. I mean, there's a lot of freedom in that. And right now, again, I'm trying to figure out what discs work for my hand, work for my arm. So I have, in my mid slot, I have five different molds. Yeah. I, but each one of them I know, I can't go to a course and not have a flippy mid, personally right now. That would yeah. be very dangerous for me because yeah. I can't substitute it with anything else. Yeah, and I think I would like, I because I've been thinking about what Hunter said about, you could go to the tour and find someone who would have mm -hmm. a bag like Brad's, a bag like Hunter's on the extreme ends. And I think to me, the thing that's like jumping out is, you said that you like, your ideal is you're throwing as hard as you can. Like that is, like that is yeah, like your 80, preferred shot. Yeah, like 80, 90% is my, that's when I'm the, my timing is the most comfortable when I'm throwing like 80, 90%. Yeah, and hitting that power shot. And I don't know if you feel the same. I know I personally, when I'm like stepping up to that 80 or 90% shot, I feel like my aiming window opens a lot more uh, when I'm stepping up to that. So I wanna take something, and I'm living on the flippier side for that reason of I wanna go 70%, 75% and throw it and like just let the natural flip of the disc try to help me on that distance gain whatnot um and i think you'll see that on tour as well you have the guys like ab who is on every shot trying to just murder that disc and then you have someone like m alden harris and i realize i'm making a huge it seems like a huge jump in mm -hmm. terms of like where they're placing every weekend but i think we've seen alden pop off we've seen alden have a great game but like you watch those two play and there's just there's different ways to approach the game so i would say when you're when you're thinking of this is truly like how how do you like to throw the disc and then i would ask you your follow-up question where how are what are you doing when you score best because there are folks that love to throw like uh trevor i know has talked i'm sure he's talked with you like we've talked about how he likes throwing distant shots he loves seeing the disc fly specifically putter distant shots 
but you don't see him on the course like you play disc golf with trevor more than any of us uh i feel like he's not often while he's on the course trying to like throw those max distance Mm -mm. flex shots and whatnot um so he likes to throw that shot but he's scoring best when he's doing something different so then you gotta decide for you like how does that work uh and find that balance so it's super interesting my my final question because we've been we've been cooking for a little bit uh and so i my think what how do you feel about this theory would you say that new london scoring par at new london is a little above like it's asking you to reach your skill ceiling right now to score above or below par at new london like you have to play your best golf to do that right now i would say the best i guess it depends on how you think to the question of um i think it's going to take my best round of like full 18 holes that I'm capable of putting together yeah. to get to like two, three under. Okay. Um, but I don't think like there's there's gonna be a time at New London during that like two under round that I'm going to mess up. And I think that is a true like, no one's gonna play a perfect round. Well, I can't say no one, Paul's done it. But even yeah. Paul's round, he had a par. Um, just said countered it with an eagle washed um but you know very few times you're ever going to play a perfect perfect round totally um i've had maybe two rounds ever that i've walked off the course in tournaments and said i didn't make a mistake and both of those rounds were like un unfathomably higher than i've ever thought i was capable of shooting yeah but it's because i didn't miss a putt inside like 60 feet it was just one of those rounds where it's like, I went unconscious. I don't know what happened. Yeah. So if that were to happen where I like have a, a round where I walk off that course and I'm like, I just shot the best I could ever imagine. Yeah. I could probably get to like six under or something because yeah. I could, in that scenario, I would be parring all the hard holes and I would be picking up the birdies on like three, four, 10, one. 12. Well, I, well I, I believe, I believe one. Yeah. And so like, yeah, I could shoot like six under in like, literally I don't make a mistake, that's not gonna happen. So I think that like pushing my current skill ceiling, like a realistic best round I could shoot, yeah, it would probably be like two, three under and my goal is one under. So it's gonna take pretty much everything I've got right now. Yeah, so you've built your bag aiming around comfort and confidence to reach that and push that. So what do y'all think about the idea of if you're listening to this, and you are having a hard time really shaping your bag right now, find the hardest course in your area. And I I think, I don't know, because we've talked about before on the podcast, people who build their bag to a certain course and they're like, all right, on hole four, I throw this weird, like any turnover thing with this disc that my dog ate and then the car ran over the disc. uh, And so like now it's there. Um, But trying to build your bag to play I'm not gonna say the hardest course in your area for the hardest layout in your area because for some of you, it like. That might be a bad course. That's, mm-hmm. yeah, like it's a terrible, like if you are, great example, uh, I'll call him out. Uh, we have a guy who is in the birdie fam uh, and we play with him twice this week. Uh, his name's Nathan, fantastic guy. Love you, Nathan, if you're listening. Uh, he's three months into the game. I think if he goes and he's like, I'm gonna build my bag to shoot par at New London shorts that's still a terrible idea three months into the game Mm -hmm. like but if he's looking at camp hideaway and he's like i want to learn how to shoot par at camp hideaway from whatever tees that may be do you think learning to build a bag that stretches you to i have to be throwing when i'm throwing my best shots i can carve up any like i can carve up the hardest course with this bag but it's also pushing me to throw better shots right now. What do you think about that like theory of bag building? So I think I think if you're newer to the game and, and you're trying to to build out your bag, uh, I think a way to get a lot better faster is to stop relying on discs to do the work for you in a certain amount because what that can create is that's how you get to where I am, where I can only throw hyzer because when I first got into the game, I had one release angle and it was a steep hyzer. So 
I needed discs to do the work for me. So I went a lot of M4s, a lot of like flippy stuff to learn it. Thankfully, over time, I worked that out of my game to learn, oh, I can throw different amounts of hyzer to get discs to do different things. But you'll see guys that the only shot they got is a crank over forehand. So they just got different levels of stability between a firebird to a tilt, and yeah. that's their game. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally think like that's not the, you're not gonna be the best disc golfer because if you give, if you take Paul Macbeth, yeah. I still, I know Paul's having a rough season. I think Paul is one of the best all around disc golfers, probably the best all around disc golfer that's ever played the game. And what he's very good at is he adjusts his grip, his arm speed, everything based on the shot and the disc into yeah. the layer. You can give Paul any disc out of any bag and he will destroy you with it. We've, we've done beginner set challenges where Paul has stuff that should be laughable and he knows how to limit his spin, slow down his arm and get a disc that is unthrowable for even you know newer players to be very workable and he can score anywhere because yeah. he knows how to throw every angle from a massive hyzer to a massive anhyzer and how to change his spin rates and everything. And the way you get there, in my opinion, is learning how to manipulate the disc to where you have, you might go to a course and you're like, I don't have a flippy mid, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. You're not screwed, you just gotta figure out what can I do Mm -hmm. to make a disc fly like my flippy mid would have fly, would have flown. And for for me, I think a big learning experience for that is like, like you said, New London, the goal I've set for myself pushes my skill gap. I mean, January I shot an 84. I'm trying to get to a 67. That pushes my skill gap. (laughs) So if I wanna shave off seven, what is that, 17 17. strokes? Yeah. Mm I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to get better. And so big thing was putting for me, obviously, if you've watched the channel, you've seen that. But another big thing was, okay, when I first played there, I was going a lot of distance drivers, a lot of fairway drivers off the tee. And yeah. I was thinking, I wanna be as close to the basket to have as stress-free of an upshot as possible. Mm. When at New London, I don't think that was the right strategy. And now I've taken this strategy to other courses where my putting feels a lot more confident. And yeah. sometimes I'm like, the shot I feel the best at right now will get me to 25 feet. So instead of trying to park it, I'm like, throw the shot I feel best at and know I can make the 25 footer. And that translation's all come from, I set a goal I'm trying to push myself to. I've now built a bag that's a very neutral, if I throw it well, it's gonna fly well bag. Um, And I've learned with my mindset of the game, it's okay to leave myself a 300 foot shot because a 300 foot hyzer I'm more comfortable with than that shot that's outside of a jump putt, but not quite a throw yet. I would rather be at 300 feet and have a wide open hyzer than be at this little like touchy up shot. So you gotta know your own game because for people listening, that could be the exact opposite for them. And mm-hmm. so if they were to come and build, do their own New London challenge, then like let's say, Brad, let's say you're doing the same New London challenge and you're watching, you're like, you you go out and you try to do the mids and my strategy of, you're not getting much distance off the tee but you're gaining control, you might be like, well now every single shot I have to throw into these greens is a 300 foot mid range. That's my worst shot, I hate that. Mm-hmm. But you love distance drivers and like little touchy putter approaches. Well then your, yours and I's way of attacking New London would be completely opposite. Mm-hmm. You'd wanna be going distance driver, get to a spot where you can have that touchy putter approach. And we're probably like, both of us would have completely different approaches, but score similarly. And that's what you see on the Pro Tour, mm-hmm. is you see guys who, you have the Alden Harris types, you have the Calvin Heinberg types, they're just ripping on Annie's. And then you have the Kevin Joneses that are throwing everything on Heiser. And then you have the Bradley Williamses of the world that are just slow and smooth, smooth as fast, fast as far. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a different approach to the game, but if you watch them, when their weekend comes, their course comes, they're capable of winning. Mm-hmm. So there's not one right way to play disc golf. Yeah, You just gotta figure out what works for you. I think, I think for me, I think we're, probably in the same I'm saying the same thing almost but just from my perspective is I think I only started getting better when I started going to courses like New London where it was I knew I know I want to shoot poorly but I know it's going to make me and I think what a course like New London or even Independence did for me is it was like hey if you're not at you know Falling Creek's pretty open there's not a lot of like errors that are going to really hurt you there yeah Uh, so I was playing Fallen Creek a lot and then I started playing Independence and New London and some of these courses that are like wooded and even Hideaway and I'm like oh I have a lot of shots I don't 
have, I can't throw, or I don't know how to throw, or I've never yeah. thought about throwing. So I think those courses challenge me to say, okay, well, you do have a use for a really overstable mid, or hey, you do have a use for a really understable putter. And like those shots, I'm like, okay, well, now I need to like start working those into my bag so I can I can go to any of these skill level courses. I'm not gonna shoot, you know, what is it, 80, 84 is what you shot? You're, I'm not gonna shot, shoot an 84. I'll probably shoot like 104. But you know, maybe with the appropriate shots and like a little practice, maybe I can shoot like a 94. Yeah. And which is still progress in the right direction. Well, I think the, um, and this is something I was very fortunate in um, when I first started the game, but it, it's, I mean, it's true in any sport, right? Is if you stay where you are and you stay in your comfort zone and you stay mm -hmm. in your bubble, that's where you'll always be. And if that's where you want to be in disc golf, that's great. Mm -hmm. Like there's a peak shoe park here and there's guys that can go out there and they'll shoot 14 under every time without fail. Yeah. Because they know that course so well, their bag's built for that course, that's the only course they play. You mm -hmm. take them and you put them anywhere else and they're beating me at Peaks U every single time. You take them anywhere else, I'm beating them by 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Peaks U Park is the game, they have the most fun there. They just throw little flippy putters. Their game, they like, literally you can go to Peaks U Park and throw just overhands with like DX Leopards and you can tear that course up. I've seen it happen in my face at tag matches many times and I hate it, <laughs> but that doesn't work anywhere else. So I think it depends on what you want for the game because that guy has just as much fun with disc golf as I do. Yeah. He might even have more fun a lot of days because he doesn't care. He just goes out there, gets his birdies, packs up his bag and leaves. He doesn't care about getting better. That's not mm -hmm. his goal. True. If your goal in disc golf though is to get better, it's the same with any other sport you play. You got to play with people better than you and you got to play at locations that push you. Mm -hmm. So with disc golf, I was fortunate where I got into the game, I was shooting 14 over at Peak View Shorts. I distinctly remember. That's, that was the goal. I wanted to beat 14 over. Beat it, beat it, beat it. By the time September rolled around, we were playing Peak View like two times a day. I got to like seven, eight under at Peak View. I felt like yeah. I'm the GOAT. Yeah. This sport's so easy. Watch out, Paul McBee. I went and tried out for Liberty's disc golf team. To try out for Liberty's disc golf team, you have to play around at Liberty East Campus. I had never played there. So the day before tryouts, I went out to Liberty East Campus. I shot like an 87. And par there, it's a 20 hole course, par there's like 64. So I shot like 22 over, 23 yeah. over. When I was shooting seven under at Peaksview, and I was like, I have tryouts tomorrow. What, what am I supposed mm -hmm. to do? Fortunately, no cuts were made uh, because not enough people tried out. Thank goodness or else I might've been cut. But once I joined Liberty's team, that's where my skill level was at. Mm. I was not a good disc golfer. I was a good Peaksview player. Yeah. But Liberty, every tag match was at Camp Hideaway, East Campus, and you were thrown in with guys on Champ Flight that were shooting in the 50s out there. So out of nowhere, I'm getting beat by 25 plus strokes mm -hmm. at East Campus. My options are quit the game or get better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly playing East Campus, constantly playing Camp Hideaway, courses that were way harder than my skill level. But what happened is I just, I got better because I just watched people do shots. And I, like, I was like, I never even thought of a forehand here. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't even make sense to me. And then I'd go to the field and just grind out. Hey, I need yep. to be throwing this forehand on hole four. That's gonna flip up a little bit. How do I get to that? And then I learned that shot and then that shot you can take and use anywhere. And so, but I think you gotta be in golf, especially uh, you gotta be willing to make yourself uncomfortable. You gotta go to the course that you're gonna shoot a hundred on. You gotta mm -hmm. go to the course you're gonna shoot 20. And yeah, you're not gonna look like the best player out there. Like, yeah, you put me on Peaks View back when I was a freshman in high, in uh, college. And yeah, I would have looked like a competent, solid disc golfer. I wasn't because you take me anywhere else and I couldn't do it. So yeah, it's not gonna be pretty and you're not gonna look good when you're out there shooting 25 over. But by the end, so freshman year, I came in shooting an 85 at East Campus. Yeah. My senior year, I was consistently shooting between a 53 and 55. You take me out there now, I'm probably shooting like a 60 something, gotten a little worse. <laughs> but that was the progression. And it was because over that time, I just constantly played hard courses with good golfers. And just as soon as I would win MA2, I'm up to MA1. As soon as I win MA1, I'm up to open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm playing an open and I was playing an open well before I needed to be there, but I'm too competitive to mm -hmm. just sit there and be happy taking last place. So I gotta either get better or quit disc golf. Yeah. So that's what I had to keep doing. Nowadays, luckily, I don't play tournaments, so I don't have to worry about that stress of get better or quit. But that was where my mentality was for four years. Yeah. And you know what? It worked out. No, I, I feel that. I think if anybody is, 
I guess the competitive nature is what kind of makes it fun for me. And again, like I said, there's plenty of people that don't compete and they have a great time just throwing putters at peaks. And I yeah. think those people are awesome. Well, that's what the, but, um, when people come in here in the store, mm -hmm. Robbie had a really great point on Trevor's show. Not that I was ever listening to everything. Sorry, Robbie, but I was. <laughs> and he had a great point where, you know, when someone walks in and they say, I want a disc to throw forehand with, you got to ask, what's your goal? And a lot of times I don't do that. I assume mm -hmm. your goal in disc golf and your goal in disc golf is the same as my goal. You want to be mm -hmm. as good as you can be. Yeah. And like when I was a freshman, when I was just starting playing disc golf, my goal was I wanted to be a touring pro. So I wanted to be as good of a disc golfer as I could be. That's not everyone's cup of tea. Some people just want to go out with their friends. And if you just want to go out right. and just play the game, then yeah. yeah, pick up that Firebird and chop over on it. Cause that's going to be the most fun way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're going to score better. Get better. Yeah. You're going to score better today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I think like that's a big thing is like, know what you want out of disc golf. And if what mm -hmm. you want is just, hey, I just want to be able to, to beat my buddy, or maybe you're just not competitive. You're like, I just kind of want some exercise. I want to have fun with it. Don't worry about form and you know build your bag based on disc selection that is going to get you the best score tomorrow, which means mm -hmm. don't worry about fixing your form. Round the crap out of it, throw flippy stuff and figure out what you can score the best with. Because if that's what you're gonna have the most fun with the sport, that's it. But then if you want to get better, that's when you have to like make the changes that suck. Yeah, I mean, I went from a all disc craft bag and the, I mean, the premise of this podcast, right, was I wanted to be better. I knew I didn't have the discs or the shots that I needed. So how do you do that? How do you explore that? Not only with disc, but different, you started challenging me with different shot types and yeah. all kinds of things. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Well, Hunter, I think this has been insightful uh, and helpful and I appreciate it. Uh, Appreciate you being a friend of the show and four appearances. Uh, and I look for, like, what was it? What we say? 68? Uh, yeah, episode 68. I'll be yeah. back. Yeah. So, uh, 12 weeks from now. Can't wait. Truly uh, grateful for you. But speaking mm -hmm. of when you're, you know, you want to have the most fun. And once again, you can work on your form and have fun improving that way. Like, there is, there's a beauty to, oh man, I spent a lot of time in the field and I did that. And now this hole that I've never been able to reach in the past, like we've there. all felt there mm -hmm. uh, at this table, especially of like, wow, I remember when I was throwing a driver on this hole and now I'm throwing a putter. Uh, like that's crazy to mm -hmm. see that progression. So we just want to encourage you both ways, but as you progress your game and you do that, you're going to need some new stuff. And one of the best ways to find that is at foundationdisc.com. So Brad, what's new in the warehouse? This has been a crazy week at the warehouse. We have some, okay, the last week, I know it was a little light. This week yeah. is Bang heavy. Rank. So I'm gonna just rapid fire a few things. We've got Mint Disc Longhorn. It just came out, Apex Swirly Plastic. Uh, we've got a cast of plastic restock. stock. We've got Berg's back. We've got the, the Lutes or Lots, depending on how you wanna say it. Those are back in stock. We've got a full MVP restock, people. So we've got your Uplinks. We've got your Paradox. We've got Craves. We've got Servos. We've got Proxies. We have Envies. Uh, I mean, anything that we've been out of for a while that's been on back we order. Hexes? Well, oh yeah. yeah, Vision Hexes, Neutron Hexes. Glitches? Glitches, we got glitches. Glitches need stitches. Yep, that's true. No. So we have <laughs> no, no, no. It's, uh... glitches need stitches. Yeah, yeah. not so. snitches. Yeah, glitches need snitches who get stitches. Keep going. That's, okay. that's here correct. we go. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, and pyros. Just check it out. Everything's going to be on recently restocked. But like all the good stuff, we got everything back in stock there. Um, I just completely drew a blank. Trilogy. There was a trilogy tour series drop this week. Um, oh. Castaplas also dropped the Crute, which I forgot. Discmania dropped the DD, well, for us, dropped the DD1S yeah. line, yeah. so make sure you check that out. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. As always, check out, oh, hats. Hunter's wearing them if you're watching it right now. Are um, new dry fits hitting the side, or is uh, that a little next week action? We can get them done. We can get Ooh, it done today. Oh, new dry yeah. fits, too. Yeah, oh. new, new dry fits. Basically, our whole new site, our whole site's new. So yeah. yeah, just if you haven't been there, recently for, restocked, baby. Yeah, best if, tab there. If you were there yesterday, it's different today. So just go over there. Yeah, yeah. dad hat performance. We had some new colorways. Yeah, gray, black, wearing. yellow. You're, I'm wearing black. Um, those were a big hit. Uh, white bogey row hat row pass are back in stock for the tour. Love and it. yeah, dry fits will be up as well. Whew. Check out everything. It's wild. I mean, the warehouse has been buzzing this week. So I'm, I'm excited for you to see the new whiteboard, by the way. It's huge oh, and yeah. there's just a ton of stuff on it. So um, yeah, check it out. Foundationdisc.com obviously supports everything we do at Foundation, including this podcast. So um, thank you to all of you who go there every week and buy discs that, you know, you want to keep in your bag. Yeah, because you're going to try all this gyro. You're going to try the new tour series. You're going to be like, wow, this DD1. I'm like... 
The DD3, whoa, 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 whoa. But the DD1, that's amazing. And when it's amazing, you keep it in the bag. We'll see y'all next week.